they believe things should pretty much stay the same. The big question facing Blair is, do we, don't we, join the European single currency? He's basically quite keen, but wants to wait and see how it performs. The Chancellor thinks now is not the right time to join, and it all results in a massive policy cock-up. Gordon's team wanted him to do an interview clarifying the situation, saying policy was unchanged but making it clear we were clearly not going to be in the first wave, and therefore it was unlikely for this Parliament. With all the chatter that had been around, I agreed it was probably the right thing to do. It wasn't so much an interview as a form of words for the Times. The Treasury drafted the words, I made a couple of changes. Good evening. The government's given the strongest indication yet that Britain will not join the European single currency during the lifetime of this Parliament. The earliest likely date for Britain's entry would be 2002. Tony called after he'd seen the news and said, what the hell is going on? We never agreed this, he said. I said I thought they had. Gordon was also now on the rampage, saying this had all gone too far, as if suddenly the headline he'd been asking for was not what he'd asked for at all. Well, I, I can't answer, of course, for every, for every newspaper that speculates about what the outcome of our deliberations is going to be. There's been uh, numerous uh, articles uh, speculating about that. Even today, writing this one day after the event, I cannot piece together exactly how we reached the point we did. I was beating myself up too because I knew I'd screwed up. I felt I hadn't done what I normally do, which is double check every base. The origins of New Labour's own cash, the promises made to their benefactors and the Prime Minister's own reputation then came under sustained scrutiny. Formula One boss Bernie Ecclestone gave Labour a massive donation before the election and after Blair came to power, Formula One was exempted from the ban on tobacco advertising. Tony immediately sensed real danger. Whatever the rights and wrongs of the policy, which had been worked out by people unaware of the donation, it would look absolutely dreadful and it was bound to come out. Downing Street is still refusing to disclose how much money it received from the head of motor racing. The row over a financial donation from the... I woke to the BBC saying the Labour Party was still refusing to reveal the size of Eccleston's donation. My own view was we had no option but to get out that it was £1 million. But Eccleston was opposed to that. And we had to wait till he agreed. It was beginning to look and feel worse. Why not tell everybody exactly how much money you gave them? Um, how much do you earn a year? Well, I'm quite happy to answer that question. Answer it then. Ecclestone did then himself reveal the size of the donation. One million pounds for answer. <laughs> the million pounds was big in the papers and we were looking shifty and shabby. It was a disaster, and getting worse and worse as the days wore on. We've slain one dragon only to have another take its place with a red rose in its mouth. Prime Minister's question time was fine until Martin Bell got up and had a go, to pretty devastating effect. I was really not enjoying this at all. That is precisely why we sought, that is precisely why we sought the advice of Sir Patrick Neal. This nightmare would not go away. Every time we thought we were through it, something else would come up and hit us. Derry Irvin called. He was worried. He thinks he's invincible, he said. It happened to Thatcher after ten years. It's happened to Tony after six months. We had the answers, but I was more worried Tony wouldn't learn anything from this. Cherie said he would. He had obviously told her how pissed off I was because she came in and gave me a big kiss and said he knew he'd handle it badly. 
and should have listened to me. I'll call you Tony once and then Prime Minister forevermore. Good to see you. I said he had to reconnect on the basis of trust. Humphreys was full of himself and I was probably a bit too rude to him. But he was so up himself it was hard not to be. Do you believe that as a result of what has happened in this past week or so, you have lost the trust of the British people? Uh, no, I don't believe that. Uh, and I hope that people know me well enough and realise the type of person I am to realise that, that I would never do anything either to harm the country or, or anything proper. I never have. I think most people who have dealt with me think I'm a pretty straight sort of guy, and I am. The interview did the trick, the public gave Blair the benefit of the doubt, and the party returned Ecclestone's money. Cherie and I both emphasised TB. He had to change modus operandi and learn lessons from this. I said I was fed up with all of them, and he said, You love me really though, and laughed. Blair's massive parliamentary majority gives him license to take risks. He invites Sinn Féin to join peace negotiations before the IRA has laid down its weapons. I shook McGuinness by the hand and he said, So this is the room where all the damage was done. It was a classic moment of different histories playing out. We thought he was referring to the mortar attack on Major and we were shocked. In Downing Street, the buildings shuddered and windows were blown out as the mortars landed. And it became obvious from their surprise at our shock that he was referring to policy making down the years. No, no, I meant 1921, he said. We hope that today's meeting will be a significant step in the search for freedom and justice in our country. I found McGuinness more impressive than Adams, who did the big statesman bit and talked in grand historical sweeps. But McGuinness just made a point and battered it, and forced you to take it on board. Tony said we faced a choice of history, violence and despair, or peace and progress. We were all taking risks, but they are risks worth taking. He said to Adams he wanted to be able to look him in the eye, hear him say he was committed to peaceful means and he wanted to believe him. If you are engaged in a process of talking to people, then at least you've got some chance of a better understanding emerging. Vera Doyle, the only Irish messenger in number 10, came over to chat to them. Within seconds, McGuinness was charm itself. Vera was clearly a fan, but said to them as they left, now you two, just behave and help out our man here. By spring of the following year, Blair was so frustrated by the lack of progress that he imposed a strict timetable on negotiations and flew to Belfast to enforce it. We discussed plans for a doorstep on arrival and I drafted a few lines. But he pretty much did his own thing. A day like today, I mean, it's not a day for, for the sound bites, really. Um, you can leave those at home, but I feel, the, I feel the hand of history upon our shoulder in respect of this. I really do. Hell of a sound bite. The press loved it. But the unionists have rejected what's on the table. Sinn Féin says it's being asked to concede too much. Blair's public optimism is not matched by his private mood. I went in to see Tony as he was getting ready for bed. He said his gut feeling was very negative. He couldn't see how to fill the gaps. <laughs> 